uh, I was in a, a restaurant not too long ago, a, a fancy one, because clearly I am fancy, and uh, they had antelope on the menu. Now understand, uh, if there is an animal that I haven't eaten before on a menu, I'm totally eating that animal. <laughs> because that's my manifest destiny. We've scaled Mount Everest, we've been to the moon, but if I can eat everything that walks, crawls, swims, or flies on the earth, that's, that, you know, that's my goal, that's my bucket list. So I said, uh, Francois, tell me about this antelope. And he said, ah, sir, this antelope comes to us from the Neiman Farms, and it has been a sniper shot. A sniper shot. Francois, I appreciate you sending me a special forces team to go fetch me my dinner, but must we resort to assassination? Do we not fear reprisal from the antelope American community? And he explained that uh, the whole concept is it doesn't put fear in the meat. Uh, the antelope is just spending its life antelopeing, and then one day uh, the lights go out. It never knows what hit it, in other words. It's like if the end episode of The Sopranos uh, ended up with Tony Soprano being yummy and his family ate him. It's a similar thing. Uh, now, I have two problems with this theory. One, I think I want fear in my meat. And if I'm going to replicate the carnivore experience, I think that fear puts a little, you know, it's a complicated palate for me. I think that's, like, you want to know that it's coming. And the second thing is it doesn't, it doesn't take into account the other antelope. I'm going to break this down for you. You're in the quarterly sales meeting. Phil, uh, head of marketing, uh, has a PowerPoint he's running through on the board. There's donuts. Uh, there's coffee. And then suddenly Phil's head explodes in a shower of brains and bone, and he drops to the floor like a puppet whose strings have been cut. And then, only then, do you hear the report of the rifle. <laughs> you all dive under the table. Millie from HR is making those high-pitched crying noises like she made at the Christmas party when she said she was going to die alone and she was drunk. That guy from accounting whose name you can't ever remember has pissed himself. And your boss, Steve, has clawed his phone out of his pocket and is onto it, screaming into it, telling his wife that the kids need to remember Daddy is a good man. And in the middle of all this chaos, two guys roll up in a golf cart with a pickup bed on the back. <laughs> Cigarettes dangling from their mouths, coveralls, names in the little oval. Make no eye contact with any of you. And they dragged Phil, his brains leaving a horrible trail on the industrial carpet of the conference room like H.P. Lovecraft's giant pet snail. And they throw him in the back of the truck, his head lolls, and they drive off. <laughs> and this happens several times a week. Now, I ask you, is this a low-stress workplace? <laughs>